Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining me in the locker room on Friday, March 4th. I'm Alan Locker. Kate Collins joined the cast of All My Children as Natalie Marlowe in 1985. She played Natalie and Janet Green on and off for 26 years. Tom Zarega, or Tommy J. Michaels, as you all remember him, played Tim Dillon for nearly 10 years on All My Children. This mother and son duo have not seen each other in 25 years. It is my pleasure to welcome to the locker room, Kate Collins and Tom Zarega. Hello, hello, <laughs> hello. Hey there, hi. how's it going? Hey, hi. What's up? How you doing? <laughs> uh, so I good to see that, you. I love that you uh, didn't realize it had been 25 years. I, I know, I started doing the math yesterday. I was like, you know what? I better go back and like, try and find some of these old episodes. Uh, and I, of course, like everyone, I Googled. Uh, and I I saw an amazing episode between you and I, Kate, um, from 1997. And I think that might've been the last time that we had worked together. But oh. um, I just went, oh my God, it's really been 25 years. That's crazy. Seriously. <laughs> well, I, I called you Tommy the last time I saw you, which I will not do now. You're Tommy. <laughs> it's okay. Now. You can always call me Tommy. It's okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Does anybody call you Tommy? Uh, yeah, my my friends, family. So, and you guys are all welcome. I answer to all of them, even Timmy. Still, people call me Timmy. My <laughs> friends out there will do that to me sometimes. <laughs> that that's very funny. Yeah, people on Twitter were like, "Oh my God, Timmy got cute." <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, I owe it all to my parents. <laughs> Kate, um, you have two boys, Luke and Jake. How are they doing? Oh, they're great. Thank you so much for asking. They are, oh, wow. How old are they? I get a little lost. They're like in their mid-20s, mid to upper 20s now. Um, they're terrific. They're great. They're great kids. They're great people. They're launched. They're busy. They have great lives. And uh, my husband, Charlie, and I are very fortunate that we're very close to them. So we're, we're happy. We're lucky. That's awesome. And, and and Tommy, you have a three-year-old, right? Yeah, my daughter, uh, Carliana, is three and a half, going on four. And uh, she's amazing. She definitely, between her and my wife, I mean, without them, I don't think I would have got through the pandemic. It was just crazy out here in California. <clears throat> and she was always, you know, totally unaware of what was going on. So, you know, she's always there, super happy and um uh, you know, every time you come home, she'll just jump on you. It's like, where, where have you been, Dad? So, yeah, she's amazing. She's so just I bet you're a wonderful father. Well, thank I, you. I really, no, I, I cannot imagine that you are anything other than very present and really delightful and wonderful with her. I, I try. I had a lot of really good influences in my life, uh, present company included. <laughs> so, certainly. That's, that's awesome. Well, Kate, speaking of, of parents, um, I'm sorry for the loss of your dad, Michael Collins, who was an astronaut and who flew the Apollo 11 around the moon in 1969. Tell us about helping him to celebrate the 50th anniversary of that historic mission. Oh, Alan, thank you. <laughs> um, wow, that's a great, great question. So it, there's, there's that picture of dad, that's his official astronaut portrait. And that would have been taken um, probably back in 1968, early 69 in preparation wow. for the Apollo 11 flight. Um, dad, is, dad was somebody that had a tremendous sense of perspective. Um, he left NASA right after the lunar landing and we moved to Washington DC, he was the um, director of the Air and Space Museum while they were constructing that beautiful building on the mall that still exists. And so he's always been sort of, he's a writer. He wrote a couple of books about his experiences, but he's and an artist. He painted, he was a watercolor painter. So he's got this breadth of perspective and he started writing about the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11 and what it might mean globally, certainly within our country, um, when he landed in 1969. And we found these notes. Wow. Yeah, it was very, it was really exciting. And of course, there was a certain amount of um, national interest and enthusiasm, especially now with the renaissance of the space interest uh, between our, our uh, private partners, if you will, but also NASA's Artemis program that is coming along 
returning to the moon, putting the first woman on the moon, and of course then using that to launch us forward further out to Mars eventually and beyond. Um, so dad has been very private all his life. He used to say, leave me alone. I'm going to hide under my rock. I'm just going to stay under my rock. <laughs> and he said, you know, maybe I'll crawl out from under my rock for a little bit during this 50th anniversary. Um, we lost Neil Armstrong in 2012. And so dad also felt a real responsibility. He would have been the spokesperson for the crew. Um, he felt a responsibility to come forward in a more public way than he might even have otherwise. So to that end, we put together, oh, I can't believe we did this. It was so an anathema to my dad. We did social media. Dad had like social <laughs> media accounts um, for about a year and a half. It was really just to tell the story of Apollo 11 from his perspective and get his voice out there without him having to actually physically go and be in all those places. Um, and then we did do some unique events. One real highlight was um, the Air and Space Museum celebrated the anniversary in the middle of July of 2019. And my sister and I have been accompanying dad on all these trips for a couple of years. All our kids came. And so we had this mm. moment in this Air and Space Museum that Ann and I feel like we grew up in when dad was the director. It was a beautiful dinner. And then we went out to the mall and they had arranged this spectacular public viewing. It required an act of Congress and everything. Um, they projected the Apollo 11 launch on the Washington Monument, which was the same wow. height as the Saturn V. Oh, and I have chills. I know. It was an wow. astonishing evening. And we stood right on the avenue and looked all the way down the avenue, right outside the Air and Space Museum, and watched as if the Saturn V were lifting off right from the mall. There were, I don't even know how many tens of thousands of people that had gone to the mall to experience this. And the, it was very much like watching people <clears throat> during the original launch, awe, inspiration, everything from little kids to, you know, I suppose my kids' age, I was going to say young adults, but that's my kids' age, and then <laughs> the not-so-young adults, and then the generation, uh, older generation that actually lived as adults through that uh, original experience. So things like that were an absolute privilege to share um, with our kids, and, you know, Dad never talked about this stuff. It was, he was a fisherman, and he was a painter, and he used to tell... <laughs> Our kids, you know, no reverence, no not. I'm just old Mike, good old Mike. Um, and they called up, you know, they grew up calling him old Mike instead of grandpa. Um, <laughs> he was fun. He was a lot of fun. Took him fishing. So they know him as, you know, old Mike who will take us fishing if we go visit him and hang out. And it was nothing about, um, this is the, the, the heroic element that one could say about dad and that whole era of space ex adventurers, explorers, dad was very contrary to that. Um, and he, he was distinctly not a hero, not a celebrity. And he feels that if anything, um, he just did his job. He did it well, which is what they expected of him when they hired him. He just did his job and did it well. So that was, it was really fun to be that close to him and to hear him reminisce and to, you know, oh, good gosh, I had to coordinate all the um, publicity and the travel. and the... You, you did my job. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe I should have hired you. Because, uh, I think you would have done it better. That, it's amazing. And he passed in April of 21. Did he get to see those personal missions, you know, Bezos or? Oh, yes. Yes. Um, so during COVID, the COVID lockdown was very beneficial for us, as a matter of fact, because my sister and I, my father was also ill during that time. Um, he handled the travel and everything to us personally. That made him a hero. He was undergoing chemo and radiation during all that time. It was astonishing. His stamina, um, a tribute to his being a lifelong athlete and 
staying in very good shape. Uh, so we were down here, and yes, he got to see the uh, the rover land on Mars, which was thrilling and exciting, and how much fun to watch that with him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in his mind's eye, he was there. He was going down onto the surface of Mars. He sees it. It was just astonishing what the technology can do. And he certainly did see and, and did know uh, Bezos and, to a lesser degree, uh, Elon's adventures and conversations with them. And it, he just was so thrilled. People were interested in going back to space. Uh, the young people who are invested in this now are unbelievable. Yeah. They really are something. Absolutely. He went and met with, is this okay if I'm rambling like this? <laughs> yeah, it's fascinating. Okay. So one of our adventures during the anniversary year is we went back to Johnson Space Center, which is in Houston, which is where we lived during mm -hmm. his time at NASA. There's also the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, which is where uh, the Saturn V, the rockets take off from. They're separate entities, uh, Umbrella and NASA. Um, but we went back and we got to meet the newest group of astronauts who are oh, wow. training to go to the moon, certainly with Artemis, and hopeful to go to Mars. Wow. And these young people, they are, they're fighter pilots, they're test pilots. They have got like three different degrees. One of these young men, and I'm embarrassed, I won't remember his name. He was a Navy SEAL. He is an ER doc, and he's been an astronaut in training, and he's a pilot. I mean, is there anything they can't do? And I remember yeah. dad telling them, you know, <laughs> his era, the only option was you had to be a test pilot coming out of an accredited test pilot school. There were not many of them. And so there was not a lot of competition. And two, he was also a little sad there were no women in that group. He always said the women would probably be better pilots than the men. Mm. Um, but what he was trying to tell them is, you know, nowadays, don't look up to me. He said, don't look up at me. I never could have made the cut. I never would have made it into the astronaut corps. You guys are truly extraordinary. And he referred to them as masters of complexity. Uh, not only the machines, but the emotional complexity <clears throat> to be able to live in space for six months at a time or longer, to be able to navigate languages. They all have to learn how to speak Russian, for instance, if you fly to the International Space Station. These are extraordinary humans, <laughs> we believe. And he really, really enjoyed seeing them and trying to pass the torch, if you will, and make sure they understood how wonderful they are. That's awesome. They are. Your dad really was an inspiration. And uh, I mentioned this before, but um, I don't think the fans know. Like when I was nine years old and we were on the show, you actually gave me a signed book uh, from your dad. And uh, that was inspirational to me. I mean, I'm a, a space nerd for anybody out there that is into space. I have uh, I think right around the time I started on the show, about a year later, maybe right after I received that signed copy from you, um, I actually went to space camp down in uh, Cape Canaveral. <laughs> so... Uh, I went through the whole program. I've probably seen every episode of Star Trek, and I went on to develop a very sci-fi tech company as a result of it. So uh, your dad inspired a generation of, of uh, tech people that I think really believe in the future of space travels. That's so cool. Tell me about your, sci your tech company. What is this? Oh, so... Um, Ma Magnetic 3D. Yes, Magnetic 3D. Um, <laughs> so how did I get into this? Uh, let's see. So... I, um, I wrapped up with all my children, got out of college and was like, hey, I'm going to go. I want to go do something different. Uh, was, you know, just finished up with the show. And uh, I started this company called uh, Magnetic Media, which was into digital advertising at the time. It was very early. We had the rights to uh, shopping malls to put up digital ads uh, when, when companies really weren't into that just yet. And then um, we were looking for more engaging technology and we stumbled upon 3D without glasses. So like a holographic. 3D tech. It was very early, uh, but the idea is that the product or the TV wears the glasses instead of the viewer. So, you know, you can put them anywhere and now you can deliver, you know, virtual reality or three-dimensional content, which is pr proliferating now uh, to a display anywhere. So hospitality, retail, experiential marketing. But then, you know, you talk about your father and, uh, you know, the, the Mars landing. 
I mean, imagine being able to take those images that are coming back from a rover and being able to see those in 3D, surface of Mars, uh, without having to put on a headset. Uh, that's where we're going with this technology, so. Wow. Bravo. <laughs> Bravo. That's Thank exciting. You. That's incredible. Thanks. Yeah, I'm, for, I'm very excited about where the company's headed. Uh, but anyway, that's if, if anybody wants to know more about it, check out uh, magnetic3d.com. Shameless plug. Very sorry. It, it, it's on. It's on uh, the YouTube. It's on the YouTube page. Um, Kate Dan Kroll says Kate is indirectly responsible for getting me hooked on soaps, um, <laughs> which I'm sure you've heard many times. Um, Tom, you you talked. I think it was backstage, uh, and for Kate as well. Uh, talk about what influenced you both on becoming actors. Kate, if you want to go first. Oh, sure. Wow. It, it was related to the move to Washington, D.C. after dad retired from NASA. And I went to a new school and I was really feeling uncomfortable, odd, strange, mm, weird. New place. I wasn't sure I was going to like it. And um, I... I walked into a classroom and somebody said, you know, I was at an all girls school. My father went to the all boys school across campus. And so we knew about that, which is how they accepted us into the all girls school. They were very kind. We were not mm -hmm. <laughs> really ready for this particular level of, of schooling. At least I was not. And somebody said, you know, the, there's this co-ed program if you go to the boys school after school, you can like maybe audition for a theater thing. So I was 12 and we went, I went across, we auditioned for this play. As a matter of fact, side note, but note, I met my husband when we were 12 auditioning for this play. What? I know, I know, <laughs> how lucky, right? Uh, no, That's we were just incredible. Friends. Yes, we were just friends all the way through high school, but we started in seventh grade thanks to this astonishing teacher named Ted Walsh, who raised up many. He was an English teacher. He raised us up to be literate. He raised us up to do all the research. We became dramaturgs. He raised us up throughout high school. So we did Animal Farm. We did a Streetcar Named Desire. We did um, uh, the Russian Chekhov, uh, Uncle, Uncle Vanya, Three Sisters. We did these amazing plays. Your mom would really appreciate this, Tommy. I think oh, I yeah. actually told her about all this because um, she knows Similar. these texts really well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we grew up doing that. And then by the time I had to make a decision about going to college, um, I didn't want a conservatory. I wanted a university so that I could get a what I thought would be a broader education. I wouldn't swear that was true, but that was the intent. And I realized that the only thing I really knew how to do well was act and try to learn about the world and people by performing other people. So I ended up at Northwestern and then uh, from Northwestern went to New York and kicked around New York a little bit and then got really lucky and ultimately ended up on all my children in 85 and da 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 we'll get we'll get there Tom, uh, please talk about mom and dad so my my parents had a very uh similar story right they both went to catholic school and the only way that you would fraternize was doing the school plays so um i think my mom tells the story that she met my dad when he was playing freddie einsford hill and fell in love with him, uh, you know, in his uh, ballad there. And once they both got out of school, you know, they went to college, they knew each other back all the way back in high school. And when they got out, they decided to start a non-for-profit theater company called Center Stage Productions on Staten Island. Back then, community theater was a really big thing uh, for those that remember. Um, and they, uh, they would do like four or five shows a year, you know, multiple weeks long. And I guess when I was born, they were probably more or less like 24 years old. And so they would be bringing me to rehearsals. I mean, just, you know, my mom would be directing or my dad would be acting in the shows. And eventually um, at like six months old, I was on stage as a baby swaddled up, you know, going around during, you know, Fiddler on the Roof. So uh, just, I guess by osmosis somewhat, I, I made my way into acting. I think my mom tried to get me into things around like three years old. And we had like a weird audition that went sideways where I wouldn't take direction of like brushing my teeth or playing with a rattle or something weird like that. And so 
uh, we, we tried again when I was six. And then from there, I just started, uh, you know, very lucky was to, you know, getting in commercials. And then um, I, I think I mentioned Alan, I was on As the World Turns when I was about nine, I was there for about a year. And then again, luck struck and I, I wound up on all my children. And, uh, the rest I is mean, history. you know, some people throw out the term I was born into it, but you really were born into it. <laughs> <laughs> you really kind of had no choice. <laughs> no, no choice. There was nothing else I could do about it. But it was a lot of fun. I loved everything about it. I mean, doing theater and doing shows like everything that happens backstage these become you know people and relationships become your second family uh so i loved everything about it that's awesome Honestly. uh all my children do you remember your audition kate and tom your screen test if you had one mm -hmm. <laughs> go ahead yes, kate I, yes i do um oh dear i remember shaking I remember thinking, I have no idea what I'm doing. I'd only been on a soundstage a couple of times, like doing day player or even extra work in, in the New York area. Um, and I was also very fortunate because the only reason my set of auditions came up was one of the actors we were going to play opposite got hung up on a film. So his arrival got delayed. So the start of our characters got delayed. And so they had these extra auditions. So I was going in almost on a lark and I um, screen tested with Jean Leclerc. Lucky me. I'm convinced that's why I got the job. <laughs> <laughs> and it was fun. He made me so comfortable that, and we, we sort of talked a little bit, but mostly he was somebody also stage based. So you could just throw anything. And we just played during that. So it felt more like work. It took my nerves out of it. And it didn't really matter if I got it or not because the experience had been really wonderful. So that's that's what I remembered. Did you have to do a, a screen test? I was actually going to ask you, do you remember if I had to do a screen test? <laughs> <laughs> you? Yeah, you, you, uh, you were very young. So. I, was, I was very young. I mean, I have some like flashes of memories from back then. I definitely <laughs> remember uh, Jean Leclerc and his like amazing French accent and his like super long hair. <laughs> um, he right. was the best. We used to have a lot of fun on set together. I do remember that. You know, let me ask you this. Your mom would probably know the answer, but I am wondering if, were you doing Les Mis when they hired you? Yes. I uh, think that's what happened. I think they saw you. Okay. Yeah, yeah I, I definitely know sense. that I wasn't yeah. getting a lot of sleep back then. <laughs> <laughs> because I, you know, the show was shooting, and I'd have to be in. I'd leave Staten Island, uh, where I lived, to get to work. You know, six or seven in the morning because we had early call times. Uh, but Les Mis would happen at night, so I'd be there at seven p.m. for showtime. That would end at eleven p.m., and then it would all start over the next day. So it's a little bit of and, a blur. <laughs> and casting directors were so known for going to see theater and and pulling people out. Well, mm -hmm. Joan Checo certainly was, but that, I would say that whole ilk of casting directors was, a, they really mined the theater. So I'm guessing that's what happened because m one of my earliest memories of you is actually watching you in that show. Oh, wow. And I, oh, I know wow. I didn't see you before they hired you. I only knew after they hired you. Um, but that to me is actually a highlight of my memories of uh, Tommy Zariga. My highlight <laughs> is I got to see you on Broadway, and I had no idea. I'm working with this sweet little boy. And well, okay, and he always knows his lines, and it's always so good. And he always looks you right in the eye. I mean, this is like, wow. Because um, he was born I, into it. Yeah, exactly. He was born into it. But I, I remember watching you thinking, oh, and he sings, and he dances, and he walks wait, wait. and talks, and, and, and. I hope you don't ask me to dance. A because... triple threat. <laughs> <laughs> now, weren't you doing double duty as well when you started? I was. I mean. I know. Joan Dianchecka. <laughs> what can I tell you? We we owe her a tremendous debt of gratitude. And, and uh, I mean, you as an adult, I mean, I know Tom just said it was, you know, he didn't get much sleep. What do you remember of doing, you know, all my children oh, by, by day? and I remember knowing at least at some moment i remember one day where i went geez you are living the dream how lucky are you mm -hmm. you came to new york you hoped you hoped you hoped you scrounged mm -hmm. about yeah you, you know i was working in the garment district during the day and all the rest of it but 
Wow. Living the dream. Yeah, Very lucky. So, Daytime is one of the best jobs. It's amazing. It is. And great, yeah. great people. Yeah, great people. Uh, you know, Kate, I went back and I was watching uh, on YouTube. I could find a couple episodes and I just realized, like, I was like, I remember that I had, you know, some dialogue and I had to remember lines and I was trying to think back to what that took. But then I saw how much you had to do when you were playing <laughs> yourself and playing Janet. And I realized that you were basically just having a monologue for half of the episode, <laughs> uh, which was incredible. I, I don't know how you did it. Oh, yeah. that was actually very fun. Yeah, <laughs> it was really, really fun because it was um, you, you ended up acting actually with the crew mm -hmm. when you were like doing the, the back and forth thing. And they were technically kind of guiding you through look over here. No, you didn't do it that way. Try this. The other one isn't going to match and da, da, da. And so that's where I really, really bonded with uh, all those camera guys and mm -hmm. uh, sound guys and continuity. They yeah. are. Yeah, they're, they're your lifeline. They really, really, really are. And they're very good acting partners. I will say that. Too. Yeah. <laughs> was, uh, uh, our main stage manager was, uh, was Penny, if I remember. She was, uh, she was amazing. Penny and um, Rusty. Penny and Rusty, that's right. Yeah. Uh, one of our fans, David, says, in late 90, 1991, early 92, when I was going through a bad time with anxiety and depression, it was Kate and Tom's storyline with Janet and Natalie that brought me a lot of laughter during a very difficult time. Oh, I'm thank so you for happy. that. We're really glad to be able to do that. And, and to tell, you. tell me what you remember about this little guy. <laughs> oh, man. Wow. Well, first off, those are really nice pants. <laughs> And, and it's Harold the dog, but what was Harold's real name? Uh, okay, so you had, um, you had Pepe and Peanut uh, were the dog's names because they had two. They had to have a double when the dog, the dog needed a break. You know? So they'd have to switch them out every once in a while, but they were amazing. I mean, that was literally like my best friend. I'd like hang out in his dressing room. He did have his own dressing room. <laughs> um, and uh, they were great. I was, uh, I was super tight with uh, Kathy, who is in charge of uh, uh, Birds and Animals Limited and working with all the, um, you know, the animals that they bring to all my children. And they had a, a working relationship with, if you've ever been to the Birds and Animals show at like Universal, they would also do that type of stuff as well. Um, but uh, yeah, he was amazing. And uh, sadly, you know, I guess a few years in, uh, he had gotten cancer and had passed away. So uh, I don't know if the fans knew that, but eventually they had to bring on another dog into the show. Did, and didn't um, he go to heaven? He did, he did. I mean, not after like making his way back across the country from Janet drugging him and sending him to California. <laughs> And then making, I mean, he was the smartest dog that ever was, that's for sure. <laughs> um, the fans were asking, did you have a dog in real life? Oh, I did. Uh, yeah, we had a lot of dogs growing up. Um, we had a poodle. Uh, we had a, our most recent dog was a beagle. I've always grown up around animals. Uh, we had a German shepherd. And, uh, so, yeah, love, love animals, love dogs. I don't have one right now, but um, I'm, I'm pretty sure, you know, I've got another uh, baby girl on the way in July, which is really exciting. So oh, congratulations. Uh, thank you. So I'm totally outnumbered and I'm pretty sure after, <laughs> after uh, you know, she's born, they'll probably push us to, uh, to getting a dog. So <laughs> that's so yeah. funny. Um, Kate, fans were asking, did you know they were going to give you both roles ahead of time? The story? Oh, oh gosh, no. Oh, no, no, no. I mean, when I started in 85 um, with Natalie, I think it was supposed to be like six months. It was not a, I don't recall it being a, a long-term thing. And certainly Janet was, I don't, I don't know who came up with Janet exactly, which writer, but somebody was having a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> and so, so is that the more fun character to play? You know, I think at some point the villain in any scenario gets to be more fun because there are a lot fewer, um, what would be the word for it, Tom, what would be the word? Uh, there are a lot fewer restrictions. You can, you can get mm. a little wild and crazy. You can kind of yeah. color outside the box and they don't stop you right away. They eventually might stop you if you go yeah. too far out of the box. You're so, <laughs> right, right. So, so Janet was a ton of fun. Um, but I think, 
you know, part of it, she worked because Natalie had been around for five years or something at that point, And God bless the audience invested in her. And mm -hmm. then I was the beneficiary of that. So, and then Janet was, so it was, it was a real synchronicity, but no, had no idea up front. No. Uh -uh. I think if they had told me up front, I would have freaked. <laughs> Like, what? what? I mean, I was watching. Well, the TV thought of it in your Mary. head, I'm, the thought of before you do it, I'm sure the thought of playing two two roles is. Oh, haunted. it's crazy! It's totally yeah. crazy. And, and even once they brought up the idea, they showed it up as I recall, like you know, a, a, like a, a test balloon drop of the hat, you know, peppered Janet and the mirror Janet. There were, we had mirror Janet. We had Janet. We had the Janet pretending to be Natalie. There was another Janet. I can't remember who she was. We had all these different names for the mm -hmm. Janet personalities. Mm -hmm. uh, but the first thing I did was went to David Canary. I said, Hello, yeah. how do you, how do, you <laughs> yeah. do this? School 101 right there. And yeah. you know what else I learned? We had a director at the time named Jack Coffey, who mm -hmm. was an amazing director, a mentor to the others. And he's the one who created that whole split screen technology. He figured out how to do it within the videotape uh, confines and the three cameras and the, all the rest of it. He figured out how to do that. So we were working with the master. Mm -hmm. And then wow. I just, I followed David around, poor David. I followed him around for a few weeks going, okay, okay, you've got, you've got a David. And I'm going to add him in a Stewart scene going today. I'm just going to kind of stand here and watch Yeah, over yeah. and over and over. And well, he made well, it look like he was just waking up. It was so easy. He did mm -hmm. make it. Yeah, he really did. He's brilliant. Michael Pomerico says, working with Kate and directing her on All My Children was such a thrill for me. She is a wonderful actress. Love her. Well, that is Michael for you. In a <laughs> nutshell. He, he Hi, Michael. Stayed. Yeah, I know. Exactly. <laughs> Michael kept us all kind of sane. Because it had to be crazy in the, in the old days when we were working together. We worked in the original New York studio, 67th street and uh, columbus and yeah. that was a that was a two-story so the <laughs> the control room was upstairs the studio was downstairs and there were occasions where you'd hear a pause and then you would you could hear the producer coming down those stairs at the far end of the studio i remember that everything would go quiet and you knew somebody <laughs> was gonna get a note <laughs> Yes, that was so a great building i, I it was, was a page, wonderful i was a page at abc across the street early oh. in the in the late 80s yeah i, mean, I love that was a great building it was spectacular yeah. N now uh, a Mike, high rise <laughs> is it really it's a high rise apartment building yeah oh, mm -hmm. that's, that's kind of sad because this i learned i didn't know this at all going in with two stories one mike pomerico so his voice over the mic you could hear crazy going on in the background he was always very calm and easy we're going to try that again. <laughs> what we are. Other story, though, is when I walked in the building, not for the audition, but I think the first couple of days, there were some wonderful prop men because that was the studio ABC used during Apollo 11 to do their simulations. And wow. so there were prop guys who had worked that. And they came to me with these amazing, wonderful stories about participating in that and what that meant to them. It was, it, the continuity on that was sort of eerie and really wonderful. And they were so welcoming too. Mm -hmm. You know, you can imagine, you feel right at home when somebody comes up and says, I feel like I know you. Mm -hmm. Wow. You, you both worked with some incredible actors during your time in Pine Valley. Kate, uh, what, what comes to mind when I say these names, you know, whatever, one word, two words, whatever you want to say, Jean Leclerc. Classy, elegant. Ooh. <laughs> do you still keep in touch? Yes. That's yes. awesome. Jean and I do. The late James Mitchell. Oh, elegant. Beautiful man. Beautiful man. Least judgmental human I've ever met, I think. Mm. The late David Canary. We're just integrous. Mm -hmm. James Kyberg. <laughs> Talent. <laughs> <laughs> Magic between the two of you. The late Michael Nader. Oh, funny. He was funny. He had a mm -hmm. great sense of humor. Oh, did he? Oh, yeah. I love that. Love that. 
Um, and your sister. Wow. <laughs> really? Oh man, she was amazing. Uh, wow. Well, was... We have to thank Steven Bergman for connecting us, but for those pictures as well. He always can pull them out. <laughs> yeah, she was like the closest to my age. So she was uh, like my partner in crime. I don't know. My mom was crazy. She like left me at Kelly's house overnight uh, on 57th Street because it was easier after working at Les Mis so that I could get to the studio, but I think she was like 19 at the time. <laughs> um, I don't know, uh, she, she was just, uh, she was brilliant, uh, a natural and so talented. Clearly, I mean, look where she is now, you know. And very family oriented. So much, yeah. Really tight with her family. Yeah, I mean, and her and Mark, just like their love story on the show evolving into real life is pretty wild, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, there yeah. It, 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 it is wild. Um, it, it is amazing in daytime to see how many couples have, you know, made it from their meeting on, you know, a little set and, you know, the families that come out of that. It's, inc it's incredible. Uh, Tom, what, what do you remember? I mean, working opposite Kate and J uh, Jean Leclerc and James Kybert as your, your family, your on-screen family. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> so Jeremy and, and Kate, you might have to help me with like the, the story here, but I, I've had... I tell the story sometimes, they're like, well, what, what was your background like? And I might just be having a conversation with someone and other people are overhearing and I'm going, yeah, I had three moms and I had six dads. And four <laughs> and they're like, oh my God, the poor kid, what happened to him? Uh, yeah, it's pretty, pretty wild, you know, that daytime uh, background. So I guess Jeremy turned out to be my half brother and my uncle because you were technically with his father Mm -hmm. You're doing great. So I'm, <laughs> so I'm, I'm Jeremy's son, technically. Uh, 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 um, oh my god! <laughs> the fans will confirm. Yes. Or, I know. Fans... Seriously, somebody help us out. Yeah, yeah they, no, they no, will. No. Trust me, they will. They will I definitely have... confirm for us. So, so there was like, there was actually some scenes that I saw where I had like a baseball game and uh, it was Jeremy, Trevor and Natalie all together. And of course, there's all this like crazy underlying chemistry, like dun, dun, dun. In the background. David is saying, <laughs> uh, somebody said Alex was his father. And now somebody says Jeremy was your dad. Jeremy was Alex. stepfather, uncle. Jer yeah, stepfather, uncle. Yeah, yeah, I think Alex was um, uh, your your. your, your uh, Timmy's biological father. You know, is, I don't even know who my real dad is. <laughs> Welcome to soap opera. I yeah, know. exactly. Uh, well, I mean, I had an amazing time working with everybody on the show. Um, I spent a lot of time with, uh, and a lot of my scenes were with uh, with James Kybert, and we just had an awesome chemistry. I mean, he would call me the Tim Man and pick me up and throw me all over the place. I, I always remember all of his wild ties too. Um, yeah, he was oh, just. Yeah, yeah. Larger than life for me in many ways. So I think um, he made a lot of those. He did, he, yeah. 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 He he the artist. And I think he did it for charity. As I think they were for charity, some of them, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so interesting, you know, because your dad was an artist and James is an artist as well. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty crazy. I'm right? sorry, Tom, go ahead. You were you I interrupted you. I'm sorry. No, no, I just uh I, I remember I had all these great memories of uh working with everybody on the show and I I you know, I, Kate, I remember, and I saw like the, a recent episode between us, you talk about eye contact. I was like, you and I were just like locked <laughs> in all of our scenes. And uh, I, I looked back on it and I, I was expecting to watch it and go, cr you know, cringe at your own stuff. And I was like, damn, we were pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I actually found myself a little like a uh, couple tears when, when I looked at some of our scenes together, you know? Oh, that's nice. That's nice. If you can, if you can feel good about it, X number of years later, uh, we won't discuss how many, but yeah, it's great. <laughs> For sure. Uh, Kate, Sean says, as a huge fan of your work, my eyes were open to the rich world of soap opera, beginning with Natalie Janet rivalry in 1991. I've gone back and watched from the character's introduction and am fascinated by Natalie's evolution from materialistic Vixen to reformed bad girl, then moving on to dutiful nurse, loving mother, and finally heroine in peril. This metamorphosis gave Natalie depth and longevity that should have sustained her rightful place as an icon within the world of all my children and protected the character from 
crappy recasting, as this person says, and subsequent death. Were you hurt by the shoddy treatment she received when she made the mm -hmm. decision, when you made the decision to leave the show? Oh, uh, well, first off, thank you. That is so kind. And I would say that's probably one of the best analyses of Natalie's arc. I thought that was, that was beautiful. Um, no, no, I really liked Melanie. I really liked her. I thought she was, she brought this real sweetness and kindness to Natalie that I deeply admired. Um, I also was very happy because in the, my husband and I got married at the end of 92, the fall of 92, which is when I left. And you heard me talk about, I got to live the dream. So I was ready to then put his career first, which meant leaving New York and he was being courted by court theater in Chicago at the time. And so he wanted to have a career as an artistic theater director. He's an artistic director, a theater director. So I felt like, oh, wow, man, I've had this incredible journey. We wanted to have kids. My joke was always I was neurotic enough as it was. I didn't need to have children in Manhattan. That might have sent me over the edge. <laughs> <laughs> So, so no, I was, I was not hurt. And then, um, you know, Dudley, Robin came to do Janet and mm -hmm. she was so good. Oh my God. She's an icon. She's so good at that part. So I really felt sort of honored that these wonderful two actresses were carrying the torch, if you will. You know, it's not always one of us that gets it forever. It's not the way it's supposed to be in soap opera mm -hmm. half the time. Yeah. <laughs> and as an actor, to have parts as, uh, you know, on and off for 25 years you had. Well, and say so that's the other thing, is when mm -hmm. they came back and said, would, it, would I come back? And that they created these wonderful stories. It is a gift that just kept on giving to me because I could do the shorter gigs. I could have the Chicago life. I could be a stay-at-home mom. I could help my husband with his endeavor. I got to do everything I wanted to do. So I feel pretty dang lucky, mm -hmm. you know? Love that. Um, with talk of Pine Valley and the reboot, would you either or both of you be open to reprising characters if that comes to fruition? What a great idea. Is that Kelly? That's yes. the, you're talking about yeah. what Kelly and Mark. Let's are call her right now. Yes. <laughs> Get her on the phone. <laughs> Tell her her brother is calling, right? That's right. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that would be, uh, I, that is so rich as a possibility. I really hope that happens. I hope at first as a fan, which I should go back in time and say, I was a fan of all my children before um, I ever worked it. It got me through high school and college. So I really, I really feel when people say, had a bad time or, you know, things were rough at home or I, I grew up watching and it was my relationship with my grandmother. These amazing stories. I feel you. I feel you. Um, so first. Oh, you gave me chills because that's for me. I grew up on As the World Turns and Guiding Light and then worked there. Walking you through know, that. You know what that means. I, I, I do. Walking through that door the first time, who did you meet that you were nervous? Oh. Like, are you kidding? <laughs> Susan, Susan Mucci. Mucci. Oh, not only that, we had a scene together. Oh, I was, I was, my eyes were agog. I think I was quite rude and just stared at her in the makeup room because I'm looking at her. She is gobsmackingly beautiful, gobsmackingly beautiful. And I think even more so in real life without any makeup on. She is stunning. The other thing that really messed with me is she was. She was so nice. And like, yeah. <laughs> so nice. We're supposed to like not like each other. I don't know how this is going to go. She was lovely. And the, I learned one very important thing from Susan. I remember her saying she always took the uh, first day of her children's school off work because she wanted to be there when they went to school for the first day of their new year. And I held on to that one and I did the same thing. So I owe that to Susan. I owe a lot to Susan. I learned a lot, but, but yeah, she was my, <laughs> <laughs> I have to tell you, I mean, you know, I wasn't an actor, so it's different, you know, doing this show, how many actors I have met who were fans of the show they yes. end up working on. I mean, that's, 
that's a mind F. <laughs> yeah. You know, like really, you know, it walking is. in. And I miss, to this day, I miss all my children deeply right around the middle of the day because it was my tradition. It was my ritual. It, I did it for more years than I was working the show. It means the world to me. So when you ask about a reboot, my eyes pop open and I go, oh, for me as a fan, I really hope so. To answer your real question, yeah, I think if, I think if they called, I might say, hi. <laughs> Wouldn't you, Tom? What would you yeah. do? Yeah, I mean, how much fun would that be, right? Um, yeah, I would love to do that. And I think that they're talking about it maybe as a, is it prime time potentially? Yeah, it's probably a streaming, I would assume. I don't really oh, know. Oh, right. Yeah. Oh, before I forget, one of the fans, Tom, you said the character for As the World Turns. What was his name? Stephen what? Uh, Stephen Barkley. Stephen Barkley. Um, I played on there for a year. Um, I do remember there being a crazy fire and all the pyrotechnics on set, which was pretty wild. Um, but then, do you miss uh, acting? I, what's that? Do I miss do it? Do you miss acting? Absolutely. Uh, you know, it, it was, it's definitely like a creative outlet or was for me. Um, I loved being in shows. I love performing with other people. Um, I feel like actors are my people <laughs> in some way. We kind of get, e get each other. Um, but I, I've been really committed to this business that I've been building and it's just about to take off. So I've been putting like, like 150% into it. Uh, but of course, if Pine Valley called and Tim Dillon needed to, to get back, uh, to, you know, from wherever he is, I think I've been like, over in France getting my PhD. I think that's how they left it off in the show. So I should have like 10 degrees by now. Uh, <laughs> if they called and said that I'm coming back from France, I, I would be there in a heartbeat, of course. That's crazy. Yeah. Um, will you put your daughter in, in theater like your parents? Well, that's interesting. Um, I guess if she wanted to do it and we had the help, um, I would consider it. Uh, you know, she, she definitely loves like singing and dancing around the room. Uh, but I was really lucky to have an upbringing that, like, as you said, was kind of like born into it. And that made it really natural uh, for me to to kind of pick up all of those skills. Uh, so I think in today's world, there's just so much going on. It's really hard to uh, to do that. Um, there's And you know, back then there wasn't social media. There's all these other kind of aspects to it that seem a little bit uh, dangerous and kind of scary to me as a dad. So I don't know. I'd have to get more comfortable with it, I think. And she'd have to really want to do it. That's actually an interesting question, both of you. I mean, think about, you know, you used to get snail mail, you know, what, you know, think about if you were playing these characters through, through social media era, it, it, it's a scary thought, isn't it? I, I, I really do think it is. I have to tell you, I'm not sure uh, I would know how to do that. And then the flip side of it is if you don't do it, not, I'm not saying ABC or Kelly and Mark, but I, I do know that actors are feeling a pressure to mm. engage with social media in order to up followers in order to get jobs. Mm -hmm. You know, there are places now that will ask you, how many followers do you have as part of your audition process? Yeah. Which I think is daunting and I guess the way of the world, but I'm grateful again, I'm lucky that I didn't have to come of age through that. I think that would be very, very difficult. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Um, you know, just you, you have no anonymity really anymore. You know, we, we could leave set and I loved it. We would come out and we would have all the fans there. They were pretty much there every day. I knew a lot of the people because they were uh, tirelessly outside uh, and, and uh, always gave us a lot of confidence. What I loved about that, it was like, you know how like when you have your kids and you, you're your best self for them, you're always, they wake up in the morning and you're like, you know, happy and cheering them out of bed and bringing them to school and kind of cheering them along the way. When we would come out of work, the fans were doing the same thing for us. You know, it was like, we'd come out and they'd be like, Tim, there you are, Natalie, how you doing? And we'd have these great conversations with people and God bless Steven Bergman who put us all together. I mean, he was there, uh, you know, constantly capturing it because social media wasn't a thing. I think we had, you know, Soap Opera Weekly and Soap Opera Digest, which is how the word got out about what we were doing. Um, but yeah, I think it would be it would be tough to be responsible for all that the social media, the engagement, uh, the lack of privacy that, that that comes along with that for sure. And, and think about how story used to get out back then, and it, you know it would be really tough to keep you know storyline plot points a secret. That's right with, with social media. True. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. did your boys follow in uh, you or your husband's footsteps? No. <laughs> <laughs> God bless them. No, um, my 
our elder son is a photographer. Oh, nice. uh, he's interested in architectural design photography, and he's got a very nice little business up and running now in Chicago, which is great. And our younger son is um, uh, has spent a couple of years kind of doing some um, health policy, things of that nature, and will be going to med school in the fall. So he's oh, wow. does he very know for different what? route. <laughs> does he know for what? Uh, neurology is is what he did his undergraduate pre-med degree in. I, you know, the, the med school is a long journey, it turns out, heck of a lot longer than I even knew to think about. So uh, he's trying to, but he loves the neurology, he loves the brain, he loves all that stuff, but he really wants to be open to experiencing the rotations, the exposures to uh, the clinicals and the education. And so I don't know. I won't commit him to neurology. That's <laughs> awesome. But a doctor in the family. No, <laughs> oh, <my goodness. laughs> so that's got to be a nice proud mom moment. I am really proud of both our children. And I think it's because, um, I mean, you, you start off, oh, they hit the baseball so well and all oh, that's so good. And, you know, uh, and yeah, med school is great, but I'm really, really proud of the way they live their lives. I'm really proud of who they are and the relationships they have with their friends, many of whom they've known for all their lives and the way they conduct themselves. They're, they're very integrous people. Um, we're really proud of them That's and we're nice. very close. So That's awesome. Yeah. That's I awesome. mean, he could, he could do anything. They could do anything as long as they <laughs> are the people that they are and be I, authentic. I can tell you that fans, uh, many of them have mentioned how they think you were, uh, so deserved of an Emmy Award, Kate, for your work <laughs> on All My Children. Yeah, here, that's, here. That's really, really nice. I so appreciate that. I, um, as I recall, you just reminded me, I used to say, as soon as that little Emmy learns how to take out the trash, I really want one. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great way to look at that. <laughs> but in the meantime, besides, you know, and this is true, I think, across actors are our people, Tom, right? Mm -hmm. Um I so admire any of those winners, let alone the nominations, let alone the people we got to work with. Everybody yeah. gets what they deserve really nicely. And they were all wonderful people. So it didn't matter. Yeah. I mean, besides, even when you were, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say, besides, he doesn't know how to take out the, the trash yet. So <laughs> he doesn't. But, no, you, but you did get an Emmy nomination, Tom, right? For your drug storyline. I did actually. Thank you for mentioning that. Um, you, yeah, it was great. Do you I mean, what, what you remember the story, or uh, it was yes. pretty crazy. The uh, necklace, was, the necklace yeah, of drugs. Yeah, it was like after I think Laurel uh, was hit by a car as a result of me doing like an acid trip, and I had to have a whole like freak out session where they did a bunch of special effects, I, and they actually brought in a real tarantula that they had crawling on my hand. Uh, it was, oh, as, it was as part of the. Uh, you know, as part the of the bad trip. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I was like smoking weed out the window and Trevor caught me a bunch of times. I mean, I was a terrible kid. <laughs> so unlike your real life children, I was. Awesome. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, no, I but, just flashed on a memory. There was a scene where you had like a, um, a candy necklace that turned out to be like little edible drugs or something. I believe and it. I was my boys were there things. that day. Really? Yes, we were there shooting. I want to say it was around the reconciliation, the, you know, in heaven thing I'm a doodle. And my boys were with me that day. Ah, that okay. was the flash I just had was them going, why is he, why is eating a candy necklace not good? I was like, okay, here's the point of the story. The story <laughs> is, no. No, no, say no to drugs. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think, uh, you know, getting back to the whole no Emmy nomination and everything, um, I, I, it did, to me, it didn't really mean, I mean, it was amazing to be nominated, right? And of course you want to win. Uh, but the whole scene around the Emmys, I always thought that that was really fun. Like everybody gets dressed up, we're going to the parties. We always had the Marriott, the food was amazing. You get to see all the actors from all the other shows that you've watched them on TV, but you don't really get to hang out together until these big events come. And so, I mean, the nomination was, was awesome. And like, of course you want to win, but uh, for me, it was these really these really fun gatherings of the entire industry that I really just I enjoyed and, and gravitated towards that those those moments that you have with people and I still remember them to this day honestly those are fun 
late nights. <laughs> yes, definitely. <laughs> definitely. Uh, one of the fans uh, says, oh my God, Timmy, you look the same, only taller. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'll take that. <laughs> and Kate is all class. What, what do you think you learned working at All My Children? Mm, where to start with that? Long list. I have um, one. Be, be prepared. <laughs> You know, come to the set ready. Well, first off, anything can happen. You had to know your lines. You had to be ready to perform. It didn't matter if you had the flu. The show must go on. Uh, so, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, for me, it, it's something that I've thought about, like, in my entire life. is like, you got to give 110%. You got to go all in. You got to put yourself out there. And you have to be prepared for anything. So <laughs> those are my kind of takeaways. Kate? Yes. No, all that. I got 100%. And I think I would add, um, you got to know how to let it go. Yeah. Because it's next day is coming, man. You can't <laughs> hold on to any of it is too precious. You're running really quickly and how to collaborate across all the areas. I mean, to have the sound, the, the camera, the makeup, the hair, the other actors, the stage management, they all come together, boom, right then. And you, you want to be prepared to do your part and you want to be a really good partner mm -hmm. and then you need to be able to go, Oh God. Okay. Oh, it wasn't perfect. Uh, all right. Well, tomorrow I'll do better. Yeah. And move on. It was very, yeah. it was a huge learning curve there. I, I love how we could all have fun pretty much right up through dress rehearsal. And then everybody got serious, you know, it's like you could be joking around and blocking in the morning. I don't, do you remember, did you work with Henry Kaplan? A bit? Oh, oh yes. Oh, oh yes. Yeah. Yeah. He would he would uh, he would always call me you know boring one or boring two. I don't know if you remember that. <laughs> oh no, I was boring two. Oh, you were boring two. Okay. I'm, or boring three. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. We were all boring something. Head you know, so the... in the morning during block thing, we'd be drinking our coffee and eating our bagels while we were doing our lines and and getting prepared for the day. And uh, I feel like there was just like a lot of you know joking around and horsing around. I remember having a lot of fun on set, and then once you got through dress rehearsal, it was. Everybody went right to serious mode and got in character. And I just love that uh, about it. We, we, we didn't know, we, we didn't take things too seriously until it was necessary, you know? So you too also, you came of age there when we ran, we taped the show in sequence. Right, yeah. Right? So from commercial to commercial was one take. They would just jump from set to set. The cameras would roll up and down the middle of the aisle. The boom guys would be all over the place. But the idea was when the set started over there in you know the Chandler library and then was going to come to the other set and then end the scene there, we were going to run it all the way through as if commercial to commercial, one take. Mm -hmm. It was great. I yeah, I do remember that. That was the that was how they did it. I think when I when I started there, and then eventually they shifted to all scenes on this set are going to be shot here. Right. Um, and can you imagine how much more work that was for the editors? Oh, yeah. God, having yeah. to take all those pieces. God mm -hmm. bless them. Yeah, and now now it's like ten times the speed of what it was back then. With you know, it's crazy. What, what... and the scenes got much shorter. When yeah. we started, you could talk for 10 or seven pages. By the time <laughs> even I left in 92, we were we were doing maybe two page scenes, a lot of it to keep it moving along. It was mm -hmm. it was great to learn all these different techniques. Definitely. You have to roll with it, right? <laughs> yeah, all right. You, you, you do. Clyde was asking, Kate, do you think Natalie was Erica's greatest rivalry? Oh no, I don't. I mean a good one. I remember Brooke. I think of Brooke and Erica as really elegant Uber rivals in very sophisticated ways. Natalie and it was just plain jealous and would go after her, you know. It's kind of... <laughs> no, Brooke, I think. That's great. And and Tom, um, you were part of the Chris Bruno story, right? Uncle Michael. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. The, the, uh, the gay story. Chris is going to join me soon. What do you remember about that storyline? Well, Chris was amazing. I mean, he was like my big brother on the show. I, I would hang out with him all the time. We did so many silly things together. Like, <laughs> uh, Chris will remember this story, but uh, it was the winter of 96, and we got dumped on so bad in New York that we all had to stay in hotels overnight, which never happens. Uh, but, you know, the show put us up so that we would be ready for taping the next day. And uh, I hung out with Chris that afternoon. <laughs> 
And mom, I'm really sorry about this, but <laughs> <laughs> we uh -oh. took close your ears, took, mom. Yeah, we we took trays. I'm very sorry, all my children. We took trays from the commissary and we used them to sketch <laughs> off cars in the snow because there was so much snow in New York City that you could like hang on the back of a bus and just kind of sketch down Broadway. I, I have that memory to this day, but it, you know. <laughs> I think that's your, January your poor mother, of 96. My, my poor Diane's mother. Diane's eyes just went, I she do went, not need to have that mental image picture for my dad's yeah. son. Yeah, <laughs> January of 96, I, I walked across the George Washington Bridge to get home. Yeah, there was three feet of snow. It was, it was crazy. There, there, was, there was no way to get home. I was still living in New Jersey at that time. You couldn't get, you, yeah, you really, only everything thing was closed. Out, yeah, it was, it was wild. Um, but the show must go on, right? So we, <laughs> we were there to continue filming uh, one way or the other. Um, I mean, that sort of story, I, you know, I caught a piece of it the other day and I realized like, you know, it was, it was very much ahead of its time, you know, all my children and having the whole gay storyline. I remember uh, I got into a fight on the show where I think Shane McDermott was there and, and maybe, um, I want to say Haley's boyfriend or husband was maybe involved and, and kind of came to my, uh, my aid to, to stop the fight from happening at school because they were, they were trying to kick uh, my uncle Mike out of school for being gay. It was just, it was crazy. Um, so yeah, I remember that. And, and uh, Chris Bruner and I were like the, the best of friends. <laughs> I definitely looked up to him quite a bit. Well, your mom just said she's very glad she didn't know that. <laughs> i live to tell the story yep you just remember that you have a little girl and another one on the way <laughs> i know i'm gonna be in so much trouble you, you you really are i can't thank you both enough for being here let's uh smile and take a picture together all three of us ready <laughs> one two and three thank you both really a pleasure meeting you both Thank, Thank you, Stephen you, Bergman. Alan. Thank you, Likewise. Stephen Bergman is right. And Tom, it's so wonderful to see you. Amazing see you. To see happy you. and well. Yeah. You too. Have a great Thanks. day, everybody. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks, Alan. Take care. Bye. Thanks so much, everybody. Thanks for joining me today, everybody. I will see you next week. Next Wednesday, we will celebrate 25 years. Cameron Grimes from The Young and the Restless will be here to celebrate her 25th anniversary. Uh, please subscribe to my YouTube channel if you haven't done so. Turn on the notifications for reminders of all upcoming shows. Thank you to Kate Collins. Thank you to Tom Zarega for joining me today. Have a great night and please stay safe, everybody. <laughs>